glad to give the title of the talk today to our introducing speaker. Uh, but I did tell you yesterday that I would have to tell a mandate to tell a little more telling story before we begin. And uh, this one illustrates uh, how much the classroom has changed in uh, the last uh, 25 years. Again, Professor Porcelli had a heart of gold. His teaching methods were uh, slightly different from what uh, most of them were. He made the mistake that many of us make in mathematics is actually trying in the class to teach calculus instead of how to do problems involving calculus, that is, how to find the derivative by learning a formula. He actually was trying to prove something, and he happened to turn around and see that everybody in the class was staring and talking to one another, having no idea what was going on. He picked up his book, and he slammed it together like this, and he looked at him and he said, trying to teach you people mathematics is like reading portraits of dolls. <laughs> Uh, talking about Paul Erdős is a, uh, also talking about what I think is a teacher. Um, he's also, I'm going to talk to you mostly about mathematics in this lecture. And um, I don't have too many uh, uh, amusing stories to tell uh, about him, but I'd like to say a little bit about him as a teacher. Uh, uh, when um, uh, Robert Perlis met me at the airport on, on Monday. He asked me who my, my thesis advisor was, and I, I said who it was, and, and we talked about him for a little bit. But actually, I met Paul Erdős a few years after I got my degree, and then my real education <coughs> began. Uh, you know, um, if you're a graduate student now, you might think that, wow, you're learning all this stuff. But really, you keep learning throughout your whole life, and when I met Erdős is when I really uh, thinking back, I, I probably know, knew before I met him only about 10% of what I know now. And, and so uh, he is really uh, an extraordinary teacher and a very extraordinary person. Um, this, this photograph of him was taken uh, perhaps about four years ago at, the, uh, at a meeting in DeKalb, Illinois, an AMS meeting. And uh, I, rem I remember one story that happened at this meeting. I mean, just to give you an idea of his sense of humor, uh, which was a little bit weird, and some of his friends' sense of humor. He was giving a lecture at this meeting, and he was trying to remember the name of Rene Descartes. <coughs> and he couldn't remember his name. And he, he said, you know, you know, you know, the guy that invented uh, analytic geometry. And somebody shouted out from the audience, Descartes. He says, oh yeah, that's right. Thank you. Um, if I could only figure out what goes on in the brain uh, when you can't remember, but you can remember, and whatever the connections that the brain makes, surely I would get the Nobel Prize for physiology. And then his, his friend John Selfridge shouted out from the audience, that's all right, so long as you don't remember the name Alzheimer's. And so this was sort of an insulting joke, right? And you know, Erdős thought this was the funniest thing he ever heard in his life. And, and, and he started telling the story wherever he went after that about what, what, what Selfridge had said. So um, very, very peculiar things uh, struck him as, uh, as very funny. Um, I think you know that he's, he's, he's famous in lots of ways. I know he visited here to LSU probably lots of times. I don't know if he spoke much about number theory here because he had many different things to talk about. And he, uh, he often talked about graph theory and, and the probabilistic method and combinatorics. And uh, uh, he worked in approximation theory. But of his 1,500 papers, approximately uh, half of them were in number theory, including his very first papers. And including, I think, his most famous papers are in the subject of number theory. His, his probably his most famous paper of all was concerning the prime numbers. I spoke about the prime numbers yesterday, and so the first part of my talk will be a little bit of review of what I said yesterday. But if you weren't here yesterday, then there won't be a review. 
Anyway, um, the story begins about 200 years ago. Gauss, as a teenager, was staring at a table of primes. You know, they didn't have computers back then. They didn't uh, have extensive tables. Maybe it went up to about 10,000. Okay, and uh, he was looking at the primes in this table, and what did he notice? Well, he noticed that they thin out. Okay, so big deal. Anyone can notice that. But then he, he, what he tried to do was he tried to predict the rate at which they were thinning out. Well, that's pretty hard to do because they're erratic. Okay, sometimes there's a big gap, sometimes there's a small gap. They don't seem to thin out in any regular way. So what he did is he started counting up in intervals of 100 to see if he could smooth out the irregularities and see, try to detect some sort of law for the thinning out of the primes. And in fact, what he, what he decided was that near a number n, it seemed like the probability that a number is prime is about 1 over log n, 1 over the natural log of n. So what that means is, is that in an interval of length 100 near n, you might expect 100 divided by log n primes to exist in that interval. So the next step was to do a Riemann sum, even though this was uh, 60 years before Riemann. And uh, so what uh, Gauss said was that, therefore, the, we should expect the number of primes up to some number x to be this sum, 1 over log 2 plus 1 over log 3, and so on, up to 1 over log x. And um, that's a Riemann sum for a certain integral. And um, is that better? And so he predicted that the number of primes up to x should be approximately given by that formula. And here's an example of how right on the money he was. Um, I gave this example yesterday as well. If you count the exact number of primes up to 10 to the 20, a very difficult computation indeed. This was done by Delaglise. He found this many primes. This is about 2 times 10 to the 18 primes. If you compute this integral, this definite integral of uh, dt over log t up from 2 to 10 to the 20th, you get this number. And you'll notice that the two numbers agree to a very, very high precision to the first 10 significant digits. So Gauss's guess as a teenager staring at the table of primes is absolutely tremendous. So what Gauss was conjecturing was that if you take this integral and divide it by pi of x, pi of x being the number of primes up to x, that the ratio tends to 1. In 1859, Riemann made a stronger conjecture, essentially illustrating that right-on-the-money estimate that we saw in the previous slide, showing that the difference between this integral and pi of x is bounded by something near square root of x. This is still not proved, Gauss, uh, Riemann's um, uh, hypothesis. And in fact, the Riemann hypothesis is perhaps the most, as I said yesterday, the most famous unsolved problem in mathematics. Uh, someone came up to me yesterday after my talk and said, I thought the Riemann hypothesis had to do with zeros of the Riemann zeta function. Uh, that's the usual way it's stated. It's stated in terms of this particular function of the letter S, the series, as you remember from calculus or advanced calculus, it converges if S is a number that's larger than 1, and it diverges if S is equal to 1 or smaller than 1. If you think of S as a complex variable, this converges for the same reason if the real part of S is greater than 1, and it diverges if the real part of S is not greater than 1. Uh, as in the half plane, real part of s greater than 1, this is an analytic function. It be can, can be continued to the entire complex plane as a meromorphic function with a single pole at s equal 1. And the Riemann hypothesis is usually stated that this analytic function has all of its zeros uh, that have real part positive 
on the line real part equal to half. But it's equivalent to what I said on the previous slide, namely that Gauss's teenage conjecture gives a right on the money approximation to the number of primes up to x. Now, what I'm telling you here, I'm not going to get into the details of this, but some amazing history of, of the problem of estimating pi of x, the number of primes up to x. Uh, it was conjectured in the 1790s by Gauss that, that this logarithmic integral is a good approximation. In the mid-1900s, Chebyshev had some important contributions to this, and Riemann proved it modulo his hypothesis. In the 1890s, Gauss's original conjecture was proved along the lines laid out by Riemann using complex analysis. And this became such an a, a interesting thing for mathematics. How could it be, why should it be, that the prime numbers, the most elementary thing you can imagine in mathematics, what could be more elementary than a prime number? What, does, what, what in the world does that have to do with functions of a complex variable? I mean, why, should, why should you need to study functions of a complex variable and meromorphic, all these hard words and these complicated things, just to study prime numbers? It didn't make any sense. But nevertheless, people were saying, it has to be there. There is no such thing as an elementary proof for the prime number theorem. You have to use complex analysis. OK, the gauntlet was thrown down. The experts said you had to use complex analysis. And then, in 1949, somewhat jointly and somewhat independently, Paul Erdős and Atlee Selberg gave an elementary proof of the prime number theorem. This was a tremendous sensation, maybe about as much as the recent proof by Wiles of Fermat's last theorem. It made a tremendous sensation at the time that, that there should be an elementary proof. I put elementary in quotes, by the way, because it wasn't an easy proof. It was a difficult proof, but it did not use any complex analysis in the proof. Um, by the way, um, I sort of once jokingly said that uh, if you, you look at this history of the, of the prime number theorem, let's, let's go back before, before um, Gauss. About 50 years before Gauss, Euler proved that the sum of the reciprocals of the primes diverges. 50 years later, Gauss comes up with his conjecture. 50 years later, uh, Riemann comes up with his conjecture. 50 years later, the prime number theorem is proved. Fifty years later, Erdős and Selberg gave the elementary proof. What do you think is going to happen next year? <laughs> you think? You know, um, there, was a, there was an article, uh, of an ex-grad student of mine, uh, John Grantham, who now works for the uh, Center for Computing Sciences in Bowie, Maryland, uh, read in the Baltimore newspaper just about a month ago uh, an interview with Enrico Bombieri, who's a mathematician at the Institute for Advanced Study. And Bombieri was speculating freely to the reporter, and, and this, was, this was written up in the Baltimore paper, that he thought that the Riemann hypothesis would be proved soon. And he mentioned a few names. I think he mentioned Alain uh, Kant from France and some other people that maybe had the inside track on proving this. So who knows, maybe before the millennium comes, we'll also have a proof of the Riemann hypothesis. And maybe in the year 2050, or 2049, in a reincarnation of Erdős, we'll have an elementary proof of the Riemann hypothesis. I'd like to, to share with you a theorem of Erdős from, from his teenage years. This is an upper bound estimate for the distribution of prime numbers. So this theorem, um, to give you a, an idea of the nature of this kind of theorem, it's an inequality. It's saying, multiply together all the primes up to n. What is an upper bound for this quantity? And the inequality says that it's less than 4 to the n. 
Now, the prime number theorem says more than this, and also less than this. The prime number theorem says that approximately a good estimate for the product of the primes up to n is actually e to the n. That's a, a relatively simple consequence uh, you, uh, from the prime number theorem. But it's sort of an asymptotic relationship. In other words, uh, uh, between 1 plus epsilon times e all raised to the n power and 1 minus epsilon times e all raised to the n power, uh, if n is sufficiently large, then that product will be, be between those two pounds. This is just a clean inequality, uh, no sufficiently larges there. And the proof of this is deceptively or remarkably simple. And I'd like to share with you Erdős's proof from his teen years of this inequality. It's a proof by mathematical induction. And it just goes on for this slide and for the next one, and then the proof is over. OK, so first we notice that it's true at the beginning. So um, if you look at uh, for n equal to 1, the product of the primes up to 1. Well, there aren't any primes up to 1. So it's an empty product, so it's 1. And that's smaller than 4. And up to 2, there's just one prime up to 2. It's 2. And the product is 2. And that's smaller than 16. Hey, this is going great, isn't it? And uh, up to 3, the product of the primes up to 3 is 6. And that's smaller than 64. So certain, you know, it's true in, true in spades, as they say. OK. This is a gambling state, right? OK. Um, now let's assume that Erdős's inequality is not always true. And uh, let's let n, capital N, be the least counterexample. Now I claim that the least counterexample has to be an odd number. Now suppose, suppose the least counterexample were an even number. OK. Now, uh, that even number is not going to be a prime, because even numbers after 2 are composite. So the product of the primes up to this capital number n is exactly the same as the product up to n minus 1. You didn't get any new prime at n. And if the theorem is true at n minus 1, you, you didn't increase the product of the primes up to n. You just increased the large size of the inequality when you went up to, to n. So OK. So the, the least counterexample, if there is one, has to be an odd number. And so it has to be at least 5. And so I've been writing it as 2k plus 1, where k is at least 2. OK, now let's get a contradiction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the, the primes up to n, the product of the primes up to n, I'm going to factor that as a times b, where a is the product of the small primes and b is the product of the large primes. And the definition of small and large is that a is the product of the primes up to k plus 1, and b is the product of all the primes from k plus 2 all the way on up to n. Simple enough. What can we say about a? Well, we have an induction hypothesis going for a, and the induction hypothesis says that the product of the primes up to the smaller number is less than 4 to the k plus 1. Okay. What can we say about b? We, don't have, we do not have an induction hypothesis about b. We have to go back to first principles and argue something about b. After all, I haven't done anything yet, have I? I haven't done any mathematics yet, just like a lot of induction proofs, a lot of setup. Okay. What about b? I claim that I have this inequality for b. That's a binomial coefficient. Think about why that might be true. You know the definition of a binomial coefficient. It's the uh, top number factorial divided, so it's 2k plus 1 factorial divided by k factorial and also divided by k plus 1 factorial. Now let's look at the numerator in that fraction. The numerator is 2k plus 1 factorial. That has in it, in its prime factorization, all of the primes in B, all of the primes from k plus 2 up to 2k plus 1. And none of those primes get reduced out of the fraction. Because the denominator is, involves a k factorial and a k plus 1 factorial, and that's not going to involve any of those big primes. So if you reduce that fraction, uh, 
all of those primes that make up B stay there in the numerator, and so therefore stay there in the integer. And so B is a divisor of this integer. And so B cannot be bigger than this integer. It's smaller than that integer. Maybe I should have written less than or equal to, but it doesn't matter. You'll see that we have a less than somewhere else, probably already from the A. OK, now the next idea is nothing to do with prime numbers at all. It has to do with Pascal's triangle. You know in Pascal's triangle, you look across a row, it's symmetric. It goes up to a maximum, and then it comes down to 1 again. And if you're in, in an odd row of Pascal's triangle, the two middle numbers are equal. Like if you're in the third row, it goes 1, 3, 3, 1. Or if you're in the fifth row, it goes 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1, I think is what it is. So, so th this binomial coefficient, the one we were just looking at, is equal to the one right after it. So if it's equal to the one right after it, if I add them up and divide by 2, um, it's the same deal. So this is a trivial inequality. Okay. Now the next one is a little bit less than trivial. Um, what is the sum of all of the entries in a row of Pascal's triangle? Like, say, in the nth row of Pascal's triangle, it's 2 to the n. Why is that? Well, you can see it immediately from the binomial theorem. If you expand 2 to the n, you rewrite 2 to the n as 1 plus 1 parentheses to the n, and expand that in the binomial theorem, you just get the sum of all the binomial coefficients. And so uh, th here in the parentheses is part of the sum, and the full sum is 2 to the 2k plus 1, because we're in the 2k plus 1 row. And the 1 half cancels with the 1 there. And 2 to the 2k is 4 to the k. So we have that equality down at the bottom of the screen. And that's the whole proof. Don't you agree? Look at my inequality for a. Look at my inequality for b, b less than 4 to the k. Multiply those two inequalities together, and what do you get? a times b is less than 4 raised to the add exponents, 2k plus 1. So capital N is not a counterexample after all, and there are no counterexamples. The inequality is always true. So here we have this, this beautiful approximation to the prime number theorem using nothing, almost nothing. And it's a, as Erdős would like to say, he wouldn't have said it about this because he was not immodest, but this is a, a proof from the book. So Erdős maintained that uh, God has a book in which you will find the nicest proofs of all theorems. Okay? That long and ugly proofs are not there. Only the short, conceptual, beautiful proofs are in this book. And we as human beings, if we're lucky, occasionally, maybe every now and then, we'll get a glimpse of the book, of a page in the book. And I think surely this proof of Erdős involves such a, such a glimpse of a page in the book. I hope you agree. Erdős also was involved with a tremendous number of other problems dealing with prime numbers. He loved to write down this inequality when he was giving lectures. Just because all those logarithms were, he, he just loved to say it, log, 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 and so on. Anyway, um, here the notation is dn is the n plus first prime minus the nth prime. It's the gap between two consecutive primes. And um, on average, d sub n ought to be about log n by the prime number theorem. But occasionally, gaps can be bigger than average. And so in a, in a sequence of papers, Erdős and Rankin never join. Erdős first, the way, this is the way Erdős would talk about this theorem. He'd say, uh, in 1938, I proved that uh, dn is infinitely often bigger. And he wrote this thing with c times log n times double log n divided by triple log n squared. And then he said, Rankin, in 1951, was able to smuggle in a factor log, 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 n. And so, and since then, only the value of the constant has been improved 
and the current record stands about two times e to Euler's constant. So it's the, the value of the constant is around three. At one point, Erdős offered ten thousand dollars for a proof that this function wasn't the right answer. That that he didn't think it was. He thought that there could be much larger gaps between consecutive primes infinitely often, and he offered ten thousand dollars for a proof that this inequality holds for every c. In other words, for every c and infinitely many n, we should have this inequality. If you haven't studied analytic number theory, perhaps you don't have an appreciation for all these iterated uh, logarithms. In ordinary calculus, you study just you know, log x or something. And you know that it, how to deal with it when you do integrals. And you know how to take its derivative and all those sort of things. But the way a number theorist thinks about the log function, the natural log function, for example, is that it grows really slowly. We think about it in terms of its rate of growth, its asymptotic rate of growth. And if you take the log of log, it grows even slower than that. But it still grows. And just think how slowly the quadruple log function grows. In some sense, you could say about the quadruple log function, it's been proved that it goes to infinity, but it's never been observed doing so. <laughs> if you think about how big n has to be before the quadruple log function is bigger than 10, think about it. Think how big, how big n has to be before the quadruple log function is bigger than 10. It'll eventually get there. But, it, but for a really, really big N. Erdős was also fond of some very unconventional problems in number theory. And um, in my talk yesterday, I showed you a doodle with prime numbers. Here's another one. This one is due to Erdős and his, his friend Turan. So, what I'm going to do is, I've written down the prime numbers up to some point, now to 43. And um, I'll write down the gaps between the primes, just the way I started yesterday. But it's not, it won't be the same problem as yesterday. And now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this sequence of gaps and see there, there are three possible things I'll write on the next line. I'm going to write a plus, a minus, or a zero. So I'll start doing it. You can see what I'm doing. You see the pattern, why, why I'm writing what I'm writing? I'll write a plus if you go up from one gap to the next gap. I'll write a minus if you go down. And I'll write a zero if they stay the same. Very simple rule. So if I added on one more prime here, 47, the gap there between 43 and 47 would be 4. And the next symbol I would write on this line would be a plus. Now, as Erdős might have liked to have said, uh, any right-thinking person would see that this sequence is erratic. The sequence of pluses, zeros, and minuses is fairly erratic. Thus, it would be certainly absurd to say that starting at some very high point, you should not ever see any more zeros, and that the sequence should just start alternating plus minus. So let me write that down as an absurd, absolutely absurd question. Could the sequence start alternating? plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, et cetera, at some high point, and continue forever. Any right-thinking person would say, no, that's crazy. Of course not. This sequence is erratic. It never will start being periodic like this. OK, if you know so much about the prime numbers, prove that this is wrong. No one's ever proved that this is wrong, this absurd statement. Of course, Erdős offered money for this, like for many other problems, maybe $100. Or 
He said he often violated the minimum wage law with his, uh, with his prizes. <laughs> okay, I'd like to switch to a somewhat different topic. I'd like to define something that we, a word that we use in number theory. It's the word density. So let me give you some examples of density. Maybe you get the idea of what I'm talking about. The odd numbers have density, one half. In other words, think about it. Take a random number. What is the probability it's going to be odd? In some sense, it's one half, right? Multiples are three. They have density, one third. What about the prime numbers? What is the density of the prime numbers, if you're understanding what I'm talking about? Well, it depends on where you're counting up to, right? Like if I'm counting up to 10, the density of the prime numbers would be 4 tenths, because there are four primes up to 10. If you were counting up to 100, then the density would be 1 quarter, because there are 25 primes up to 100. If you're counting up to 10 to the 20, if you remember that number from earlier, the density would be about 0 0.02. So what we mean by density is not stopping at some finite point, like 10 or 100 or 10 to the 20, taking a limit as you go to infinity. So here we'd be taking the limit as x goes to infinity of the number of primes up to x divided by x. And that limit, by the prime number theorem, is 0. The primes have density zero. In fact, this is a corollary of Euler's work in the, um, the fact that the sum of the reciprocals of the primes is infinite, unbelievably, has the counterintuitive corollary that the primes have density zero. You can look at other sets of numbers. For example, the square free numbers. A number is square free if it's not divisible by any square except for 1. So for example, 12 is not square free. This is divisible by 4. But 13, 14, and 15 are square free. The density of the square free numbers is 6 over pi squared, which again is a beautiful chapter in number theory. Not every set of numbers has a density. For example, if you take numbers with an even number of digits, that set of numbers does not have a density. You might say, density a half, right? Because number of digits, it's either odd or even, why should you favor one over the other? Density a half. But in fact, it doesn't have a density, because if you, let's say we go up to um, start at, uh, at 10 to the 100. At 10 to the 100, that's the very first number with 101 digits. And if you go all the way up to 10 to the 101, minus 1, every single number that you look at has 101 digits. And so at 10 to the 101 minus 1, at least 90% of the numbers you've looked at have 101 digits. 90% of the numbers you've looked at are bigger than 10 to the 100. But in the next time you go up by a factor of 10, 90% of the numbers you look at have an even number of digits. So there's this oscillation prevents the limit from existing, and so this set of integers does not have a density. Yeah? No. no. The primes, set of primes has a density, and the density is 0. It says that the existence of a limit, and so in this case the value of the limit is 0, but not all limits exist. And so if you count the number of integers up to x with an even number of digits and divide that by x, then that limit does not exist, as x tends to infinity. Who was the first mathematician? Maybe it was Pythagoras. He existed about 2,500 years ago. Maybe the first mathematician that we know the name of the mathematician. Uh, 
Pythagoras had a problem, mathematical problem. Um, he talked about amicable numbers. This is perhaps the oldest unsolved problem in mathematics. Erdős was the very first person to prove the amicable numbers at density zero. Essentially, a gap of 2,500 years of an unsolved problem. Um, what are amic amicable numbers? The first example, an example known to Pythagoras, was the pair of numbers 220 and 284. What I've listed under the number 220, 1, 2, 4, 5, and so on up to 110, does anyone recognize the sequence of numbers and what property it has with connection with 220? Why did I list these numbers underneath 220? They're the divisors of 220. I've left out one. I've left out the number 220 itself. But other than that, I've listed the divisors of 220. And here I've done the same with 284. Now, for some reason, I don't know why, Pythagoras thought to add up these divisors. Adding them up doesn't make much sense, but he did it. And if you add up these numbers, these divisors of 220, you get 284. And if you add up these divisors of 284, you get 220. And so he said that these two numbers were like friends. They were amicable. Now, obviously, this is a special property for numbers to have, right? Obviously. But it was not proved till Erdős proved it in the 1950s, that it is a special property, that the proportion of numbers up to x which belong to an amicable pair tends to zero as x tends to infinity. Are there infinitely many such amicable pairs? Nobody knows the answer to this. The conjecture is that yes, there are, but it has not been proved. I hope we don't have to wait another 2,500 years for the answer. I'd like to go now to a, a, a second most famous theorem of Erdős. This deals with the function little omega of n, omega of n. It has a very simple definition. It's the number of prime divisors of n. So I write it this way, summation p dividing n of 1. So the, the code here is that P, the letter P, stands for a prime number, a generic prime number. And this vertical bar means divisor of. And uh, this is just, I count one every time I have another prime that divides n. So for example, if I have the number 15, how many prime divisors does 15 have? Two. It's three times five. How many divisors, prime divisors, 641 have? We looked at this yesterday. It's 641 is a prime number, so it just has one prime divisor itself. 1,000 has just two different primes that divide it, because 1,000 is 10 cubed, and 10 is 2 times 5. 1,001 has three prime factors. Does anybody know what they are? Right, 7 times 11 times 13. I'm beginning to crackle here. I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> but I um, hope, you, hope it, you don't mind my crackling. OK, so we haven't seen some logs for a while. So let's see some logs. Hardy and Ramanujan proved early this century, that omega n is usually about log log n. The function is erratic. It sometimes is small, sometimes is large. But usually, it's about log log of the number that you're considering. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by usually? Well, I've written down here what I mean by usually. It means take any epsilon you want, no matter how small, like 0.01, whatever, and look at this inequality. 
1 minus epsilon times log log n, 1 plus epsilon times log log n. Omega n is between those two numbers. That the set of n's with this property have asymptotic density 1. In other words, if you count the number of n's up to x that satisfy this inequality and divide that count by x and let x tend to infinity, the limit is 1. So that's why they, Hardy and Ramanujan were able to say this. That's sort of an uh, unbelievably interesting theorem that why should this double log function get involved? Now at the risk of alienating you, I'd like to show you some of the mathematics that's behind this. The starting point, which I will not show you, is this theorem. This is, this is essentially Euler's theorem from the mid-18th century, that the sum of the reciprocals of the primes up to x is log log of x plus a bounded error. So the big O of 1 means a bounded error. A corollary of this is that I can say something about the average of the function little omega n. This is not quite an average, but if it were an average, uh, I'm here I'm counting for all integers n up to x, omega n, I'm adding them up, I should be dividing by x to get the average. So you can, if you want to, you can divide by x in your mind here in this equation. And it's saying that the average of omega n for n up to x is log log x plus a bounded error. Now, let's see the connection between the starting point and this corollary. Let's see the proof. Okay, the proof goes as follows. I rewrite omega n with what its definition is. The definition of omega n is the sum of p dividing n of 1. And then the only trick in the proof is to interchange the order of summation. These are both finite sums. There's no big trick in interchanging an order. The big trick is thinking about how to write the interchange sum. So here, p stands for an arbitrary prime that divides the number n, and n stands for an arbitrary integer up to x. So what does that say about p? It says it's a prime, and it says that it's less than or equal to x. So I have this condition on p. And now here I have the integers n, and now that I've fixed p, I'm saying that p must be a divisor of n. So this inner sum now is just how many multiples does the prime p have up to x? Well, what are the multiples of the prime p? They are p, 2p, 3p, 4p, 5p. How far do you go? You go until you get above x. You go up until you get to kp, where k is the greatest integer in x over p. So the inner sum is just the greatest integer in x over p. OK, now I make an error. I remove the integer part sign. Now, the error that I produce in removing the integer part sign is at most 1 per term. And the number of primes up to x is at most x. So the most error that I introduce is at most order x. And so then I have this sum x over p. And then you can complete the proof yourself. Put in the starting point into this last thing. Back to the x out of the sum. I have summation 1 over p put in what summation 1 over p is, it's log log x. And so I get x times log log x, which is what is being asserted here. I heard this joke. How do you know if you've been captured by the math mafia? We make you an offer you can't understand. <laughs> OK, now I hope, I hope this isn't. Uh, isn't such a uh, thing that you can't understand, but it's going to get a little bit worse before it gets better, so, so just bear with me. I'd like to tell you a theorem of Erdős's close friend, Turan. This theorem was proved in the 1930s, I believe. The theorem says that if I take the number of prime factors of n and subtract from that log log x, and sum that for n up to x, the square of that difference, that the result is essentially big O x times log log x, less than a constant times x times log log 
Now, this is interesting to, for me to tell you this for, for two reasons. One is that this argument is, uh, was invented by Turan just sort of just out of his ingenuity. And um, he didn't know any probability theory. And if you look at the previous slide, the previous slide um, talked about the first moment of omega n. And uh, its average value is log log x. So what would a probabilist do? A probabilist would look at the second moment. Essentially, it's a variance calculation. You'd subtract the average from the typical and square. Get a mean square from the average. But Turan didn't know this. He just was inventing it for himself. Only afterwards did people notice this for what it was, that it was a, a variance calculation. But look at the significance of, of this inequality, the reason that I write it here. Let's see if we can use that inequality to prove the theorem of Hardy and Ramanujan. So here I write log log x. Hardy and Ramanujan would have considered uh, log log n. But for n's up to x, the difference is pretty negligible. Almost all n's up to x have log log n and log log x almost exactly the same thing. So bear with me on that. And so let's look at the bad ends, the ends for which omega n is too big or the ends for which omega n is too small. Any such n, what would it, comp what would it contribute to this? If you had such a bad n, then this gap here would be at least epsilon log log x. And if I squared epsilon log log x, I'd get epsilon squared times the square of log log x. And so the number of such terms in the sum has to be smaller than or equal to the right side divided by epsilon squared log log x squared. And if I divide log log x by the square of log log x, I get a log log x in the denominator. And then I let x tend to infinity. And this function here tends divided by x will tend to 0. It's a little low of x. This proves that the n's with these property have density 0. And it proves the hardy ramanujan theorem. Now, I was going to show you a proof of Turan's inequality. But um, I'm running a little short of time, and it's a little complicated. So I think I'm going to skip it. I want to make sure I get to the next couple of things in my talk. So I'll skip those. I told you that there was a hint of probability theory here. So let's talk a little bit about probability theory. It's a very famous quotation of Albert Einstein. He said, in response to the theory of quantum um, physics, which he didn't quite believe, he said, God does not play dice with the universe. Now, I gave a talk at a meeting of the AMS shortly after Erdős died. And I, I, I said that Erdős and Katz, I would like to think that they would have responded to Einstein this way. Maybe so. But something's going on with the primes. And a, a newspaper reporter happened to have been at my talk. And um, it was reported in the newspaper that Erdős and Katz actually said this. And I was just making it up. It's, it's amazing how, how um, some historian in the future is going to be reading that newspaper and, and seeing that, that Erdős and Katz actually said this, because it's in the newspaper. It must be true. And um, they never said it. I just it was a figment of my imagination. Let me explain why I'm saying this. We already saw that the Turan argument really had echoes of, of probability theory. Now, in some sense, the theorem of Turan and the theorem of Hardy and Ramanujan is interesting. What it's saying is that if you look at, here's log log x on the real, ax, real axis. And if you look at integers n, where little omega n is smaller than 1 minus epsilon times log log x, they have density 0. So I've written the 0 function here. And if you look at integers n, such that little omega n is greater than 1 plus epsilon times log log x, they have, they have density 0 also. So if you look at a distribution function for this distribution, so the number of integers n whose little omega n is less than or equal to 1 plus epsilon 
times log log x, it'll already be density 1 and stay at density 1 from then on. And what, how does it jump from 0 to 1? How does this happen? How does this catastrophe happen that at some particular discrete point the function just jumps from 0 to 1? We want a finer measure of what's happening in that interval. The absolutely remarkable theorem of Erdős and the great probabilist Mark Katz is this. Look at the number of prime factors of n and consider the set of those numbers n where omega n is less than or equal to log log n plus u times the square root of log log n. So what's u? u is any real number you choose. u is any real number you choose. It could be a large positive number, or a large negative number. It could be zero. For every u, you have a set of numbers. Then this set of numbers has an asymptotic density. And the asymptotic density is, there it is. That's a formula for it, that integral. Does that look, integral look familiar to you? This is the Gaussian distribution. This is the bell curve. What we're saying here is that, yes, the mean of the distribution is double log. And the, and the standard deviation is the square root of the double log. And we have a Gaussian distribution. So that's why I made up that quotation of Erdős and Katz, that if God doesn't play dice with the universe, something must be going on with the primes. Now, the story about how this proof came to be is remarkable. I have this quotation. Um, I'm not sure if it's all going to fit. So if I remember it correctly, this is Mark Katz speaking. If I remember it correctly, I first stated as a conjecture the theorem on the normal distribution of the number of prime divisors uh, during a lecture in Princeton in March 1939. Fortunately for me and possibly for mathematics, Erdős was in the audience, and he immediately perked up. Before the lecture was over, he had completed the proof. The idea of Katz to prove this was to assume that being divisible by different primes are independent events. So what is the probability a number is divisible by 2? A half. What is the probability a number is divisible by 3? A third. What should be the probability a number is divisible by both 2 and 3, namely by 6? Should be a sixth. It seems to be right that Katz was right. But he assumed that not only were they independent events for small primes, he just assumed it went all the way up. It kept on being independent, which he knew was not a completely correct proof. What Erdős knew was that, first of all, the bigger primes up to x weren't very important because an integer can't have too many of them as prime factors. And secondly, he knew the method of the sieve of Brun, someone I mentioned yesterday, who showed independence up to pretty high numbers of, this, of Katz's idea. And so he knew that he'd be able to make Brun's sieve work to complete <laughs> Katz's proof. And that's why Erdős knew that he could do it. And so snowed cats in the process. I'd like to show you another remarkable theorem of Erdős, something that's totally unexpected. I'm going to invent a silly arithmetic function, f of n. Not a very original name. Um, f of n, you look at the n by n multiplication table. I know the younger people in the audience might not know what a multiplication table is. But older people, we had to study it when we were in school. We had to memorize it, like the 10 by 10 or the 12 by 12 or whatever. Maybe, maybe the younger people did, too. Anyway, um, let's look at a very simple multiplication table, 2 by 2. OK, so here's the 2 by 2 multiplication table. And how many, look at the numbers in the matrix there. You see the numbers 1, 2, and 4, and you see the number 2 twice. So the number of different numbers in that table are, there are three different numbers, 1, 2, and 4. And here, in the 3 by 3 table, well, you can see the numbers below the diagonal match the numbers above the diagonal. So there, there are six different numbers there. 
So what would you conjecture about f of n? In the n by n table. Okay, we have the symmetry of the multiplication table above and below the main diagonal. It's a symmetric matrix. So it can't be more than about a half n squared. Maybe it should. What? Maybe it's n, n plus 1 over 2. It certainly works for 2 and 3. Well, let's look at it. That's not enough evidence. Let's look at a bigger example. Here is the 10 by 10 table. So I, I haven't written below the main diagonal. It's below the main diagonal. It, it's exactly the same as above. And some of the numbers appear in green. And the reason the numbers appear in green is because they're duplicates. They've already appeared elsewhere. So for example, th these numbers here in the two row, 4, 6, 8, and 10, already appeared in the top row. So I don't have to, you know, I don't have to count them again. I'm just counting the number of different numbers. And there are a few other green numbers. And the total number of black numbers, the total number of different numbers in that matrix is 43. So the n times n plus 1 all divided by 2 is not holding out. But, but maybe, maybe these green numbers are negligible asymptotically. Maybe you might conjecture that f of n is about a 1 half of n squared. In other words, let's divide f of n by n squared and ask how does that behave as n goes to infinity? Does it approach a limit? And if it, does it approach the limit one half, for example? Or is it something smaller than a half? I won't keep you in suspense much longer. Erdős's multiplication table theorem says that the ratio f of n divided by n squared tends to zero as n tends to infinity. So the thing you saw with the 10 by 10 square there where some numbers were in green but a lot more numbers were in black, you looked at a really, really high number, almost everything would be in green, and very little would be in black. The reasoning behind this theorem is something that I've already told you. The typical number in this matrix is smaller than n squared, of course. And so a typical number below n squared should have about log log of n squared prime factors. Well, the log log of n squared is only a constant away from log log of n. Now let's look at a typical product. Let's say a typical a times b. a, a number in this range, 1 to n, should have about log log n prime factors. And a typical number b in this range, 1 to n, should have about log log n prime factors. So the product a times b. Well, there might be some duplicates in the primes, but not too many. And a typical a times b should have about two log log n prime factors. That's not typical. A typical product is not a typical number, is essentially what is behind this proof of Erdős. A typical product has too many prime factors in it. And so most numbers aren't there in the table. I'd like to close my talk with a personal anecdote about how I first met Paul Erdős. It was in my second year at the University of Georgia. It was in the spring, April of 1974. I was listening to a baseball game on television. And uh, it was sort of an exciting event. Uh, Hank Aaron of the Atlanta Braves had already tied Babe Ruth's career home run record of 714. And uh, everyone was just